to this session as an introduction to the symphony framework. Um, my name is Richard Miller. I work at the Sensei Labs UK in the country. Um, so we're in this country's branch of kind of Sensei Labs, but are the company behind the um, symphony framework originally. Um, and I um, blog less frequently than I used to at richardmiller.co.uk um, on uh, symphony related things. So, do some marketing type for it. So, uh, Sensio Labs UK is part of the Inbika group, but it's also Inbika and Session Digital, which are our e commerce um, part. So, for Sensio. Sensei Labs, I tend to do, I do some development sometimes, I do training, consultancy, internal coaching and stuff on um, the use of Symphony in particular. <coughs> so, um, I'm going to try and do a pretty quick sort of tour of some of the stuff um, to use Symphony, a few of the tools that are involved, and also try and maybe say you on why it's a good thing, and some of the other reasons why if you're Drupal developer, and particularly when Drupal 8 comes out, it uses some of the parts of Symphony. Why it would be a good thing for you, um, why it's a useful uh, to learn this framework, and how it can also sort of complement uh, Drupal applications. Um, so. And so, one so first thing to say about with uh, well, Symphony 2 is that it's a selection of comp it's um, like a set of components that you can use separately, and it's also a full stack framework. So, it's a so full stack framework will be what I'm going to talk about today, but with reference to some of the components, some of those components are now being used in quite a lot of other projects, um, things like Doctrine and Guzzle and other frameworks and CMSs as well. So, hence the connection with sort of Drupal because of the um, Drupal 8 having quite a few of these sort of symphony components making it up. So one of the reasons it's quite useful, if you're going to look at learning a framework, um, <coughs> it's a good one because there's a lot going to be quite a few similarities. You'll see some of the same components and um, same bits of sort of code, same objects and things being used um, within Drupal, especially if you're doing like module development and things, and also within uh, symphony. Okay, so... Uh, starting point, if you're going to make a new application with Symphony, is to grab a copy of the uh, standard edition. So this is all those components and some extra things that kind of tie them together to make the framework, um, and a kind of base starting point folder structure for creating that application. And so you, you can find this on the Symphony website, so it's symphony.com, there's a big download button up in the top corner. When you get to that, there's this first sort of... Um, point where you need to choose which version of it you want to install. So, quick thing on so that is that Symphony has a kind of um, release plan as it goes. So, currently the latest version is a 2.4, um, but if you want to kind of, the 2.3 is a long-term support release, it might be the one to go for if you're not wanting to kind of make sure that after sort of six months, well, another three months, I think it is now, that you move on to 2.5, because 2.4 will no longer be supported at that point. So um, 2.4 for all the latest sort of cool new features and things. 2.3 if you want the um, sort of stability and long-term support where you'll continue to get security updates and things all the way up to sometime in 2016, when uh, I think 2.7 will be the next long-term support release. <coughs> okay, you can download a kind of zip file with all the stuff in, but the kind of preferred way of getting going with uh, one of these projects is to use Composer. So, are you familiar with Composer at all? Is that so, um, I think Drupal 8 will be using it, but Composer is a package management tool for um, PHP that's come about in the last few years and has sort of grown quite a lot in popularity. So, it deals with um, local project-specific um, dependencies rather than sort of system-wide ones as Pair did. 
So you can use it at its simplest to kind of define with a JSON file a list of, sort of third party things that you want to include into a project. So um, it can do a few other bits and pieces, but the main thing is you require these dependencies. Um, it's downloaded as a sort of tool, um, like a file file that you can run, either like, keep it locally or install it globally. Tell it to install the dependencies, and off it will go, gather them all, usually from GitHub, um, and stick them all in the vendor directory. And it will also set up auto-loading at the same time, so um, you can sort of start using those quite easily. <coughs> and uh, alongside Composer, there's Packagist, which is a website where you can go and look up all these different things that you can, um, all the different sort of packages that you can install using Composer. So if you go there, search for different things. So this is Symfony console component, so it uses standalone to make little console applications and things. Um, then, yeah, you search in there, find that, and it will give you a bit of information about the different versions and their dependencies and things like that. And it, recur it recursively handles dependencies as well. So if you say, I want Symfony console component, uh, word pack that only requires that you've got at least PHP 5.3. But others will say, actually, if you're going to install this, you need to install this, um, and down the line. So it will gather all those dependencies for you. So in this case, what we do to use it is run, has a create project command that you can use to actually start fresh. And we're going to say we want a Symfony Framework Standard Edition. And we want to create it, in this case, going to make a not very good, but a sort of task list um, application. And um, we want to task, put it in a task list directory, and we want to use version 2.4.2 of, um, of Symfony. <coughs> okay, so um, so I'll put that into our command line and set it going. And it usually has a bit to think about it for a while because it gathers sort of a load of information from packages to know where to find the packages. And then you sort of see it flying past um, installing all these various sort of different dependencies that Symfony uses. So as well as the Symfony components, it installs things like Doctrine, that's the RM, Twig, that's the templating lang um, library that it uses, uh, Swift Mailer for mail, for sending emails and things like this. And one of the newest, in the later versions of Symfony, at the end, it'll also ask you to kind of set the various uh, parameters, sort of basic parameters that are in a, stored in a YAML file, but, um, and you can go in and edit those directly, but it just kind of gives you some default values and lets you choose them. So in this case, as I was sort of going through and testing it, kind of leave everything, database stuff fairly default, apart from the database name, changing that to task list. <coughs> And once all that's done, um, because it's a framework rather than like a CMS, you don't get very much in the way of, um, you know, you've installed it and there's something to use. You do get a little welcome page and things. Um, if you go to, um, once you find up a web server, if you go to the home page in the dev version. So with Symfony, you've got two, um, everything kind of goes through one central class at the start, a front controller. And you've got ones for the development environment and one for a production environment. By default, you can add more, but um, so the development environment is a bit slower and it does stuff like gather information on what's going on and it checks caches and things like that. The production environment much quicker, but you'd have to manually clear the cache whenever you make changes. So um, this kind of welcome page is only there in that development environment because essentially it's there as something you can throw away once you've got, got going. Okay, so um, you also get, I mentioned the console before, but there's quite a lot of console commands that come with Symfony out of the box that we can use for various things. Um, and you can access this at the command line for the directory that you created before. So we create a task list directory. If we move into that, we can do app console, and it all gives a list of commands. It's cut up here, but there's various sort of commands that are there by default. Um, One thing that's quite useful is that there's a 
built-in web server, uh, well, you can use the 5.4 built-in web server, there's just a little command, app console server run, that will fire up a web server on local host uh, 8000. Um, so you can fire that up, go to local host 8000, you'll see that welcome page that I showed you before. <coughs> okay, so... Um, first thing we'd want to do on creating an application would be to generate a bundle to keep our code in. So uh, bundles are essentially Symfony's equivalent of modules. Um, it's just the terminology it uses. So uh, you keep your code in them. They're there as part of the actual framework to kind of tie all those components together. And there's third-party ones that you can use to add additional functionality in. Okay, so... At the console, app console generate bundle, it'll go through, ask you various questions like what you want to call it, and the type of configuration format you want to use, and things like this. And then once you're done, it'll generate that bundle for you, get it set up. So, our file structure now looks something like this. So, I opted for an Invica task list bundle, so it'll set you up this basic sort of um, structure of... Uh, somewhere to keep your template files, somewhere to keep controller classes and things like that. You can also see that some of the other folder structure that the standard um, edition of Symfony gives you. So there's app at the top where all the config sort of goes, source where we put our bundles, vendor which Composer stores all those dependencies in. So you wouldn't touch the code in there, you'd let Composer manage those for you. And web which is the public um, directory, so you point the web server at serving up the contents of web. <coughs> and you can see also that Acme is this sort of demo bundle that that welcome page and things like that live in, so it's there when you first install it, but you'll probably want to remove it fairly quickly once you actually start to create your own code. <coughs> so in that um, generated bundle, there's, usually, there's a default controller created, so with Symfony, everything hits one of the front controllers and then the routing module kicks in and decides which kind of individual controller should handle that request. And then in there, you um, do whatever you need to do to create a response and send that back to the browser. So in this case, we're using annotations for configuration. Um, you can also use YAML and XML. As well, it's pretty much just down to which one you have a preference for. Uh, Annotation is quite good for being in line. You can see what's happening. Um, but some people just have a real aversion to them because they're uh, comments, essentially. Um, so in this case, we're setting a sort of static routing thing that says, if I go to hello and something, then come to this action. So we'll start doing something with it. But I'll start by... Uh, Replacing it, so we're going to make a task bundle. So we're going to I've renamed it to task controller, um, and we've kind of got pretty much the same thing going on. <coughs> and uh, Symfony's whole thing is geared towards this concept of we are it's an HTTP framework, and we're making explicit the fact that we're getting requests and turning them into responses. So in this controller action, the first thing we're going to do is take in the request object. A little bit of magic happens here because it uses that type hint of request that you can see just after index action. When you use that, the framework knows that you want to get the request object. And the request object that comes in wraps the get, everything that came in through get, post, the cookies, the session, and things like that, so we can access those. Um, and if you're not familiar with 5.3, and you see at the top these, um, because it's all namespace classes, so request actually lives up in this. HTTP Foundation um, component. So, and we use it to sort of tell it the address where it can find that um, find that class because there's other request objects that live elsewhere. So, <coughs> once we've got the request object, we can actually it has an attributes property on it where we can get the name. So this is actually the name. So whatever value we put in there, hello something, we can get the name, and then we'll do a really dirty kind of way of making response, which is we want to create a response object. And we're just, it takes in a string as its first argument. So we're just saying, oh, we'll say hello to that name. And it would look something like this. So not very exciting, but we've essentially done that job of request into a response. So 
Um, <coughs> so one thing with these controllers then is, yeah, you do essentially it needs to return a response um, object back to the rest of the framework. So the framework's kind of done a load of stuff, dumped us into this action, and we're going to return a response, and then it's going to deal with actually kind of outputting that to the browser. If you don't return a response object from it, you'll get um, like an exception for an error page to say, hey, you can't just do anything, you do need to return a response. Um, just by saying that, there's a few sort of tricks that you can do to kind of try and clean up some of the kind of more repetitive code that we'll need to do. So one thing we can do is, instead of taking that whole request object in, is just get the name passed directly in. So by making it the same, the argument the same name as the um, parameter in the uh, placeholder in the root there, we'll get it automatically passed in. So we can lose that first line, cut down the code a little bit more there. Um, one brief sort of side is that the routing in Symphony out box is, is quite static, and um, which may not be what you're used to. Quite often, especially with CMSs and things, you, um, routes can be set in and you know saved to the database and things like that. There is actually now a component um, that's not in there out box you can install that makes them more dynamic, um, and. <laughs> That component actually came about as a collaboration between some guys who are making a CM, the Symphony CMS. It's like the building blocks to make custom CMSs. The Easy Publish 5 guys who are moving to a Symphony, moved Easy Publish over Symphony 5, and uh, people working on Drupal 8. So they all collaborated to kind of make a more dynamic routing bundle. So if you're using this alongside a CMS, you may not need it. If you are doing um, but if you need stuff where someone can actually set the routes and save it to a database and things like that, then that's something to, to look for. But we'll stick to the static routes today. <coughs> okay, so um, in our first example, we're getting everything to controller. We're not kind of, we're getting it to do a bit too much. So it's not it's as simple as our thing is. It would be nice to actually use a template rather than just sort of output stuff straight into the response object. So. Um, the, our controller here extends from Symfony sort of base controller, and that gives us a few extra sort of um, helper methods. So one of those is render view, and what that does is takes renders a particular tw twig template in this case, and takes a second argument where we pass it our um, an array of <coughs> um, variables that will be available to the template. So uh, in this case, we're saying we've got a twig template called index.html.twig to match our um, action name. It's in, it's in the task folder, and it's in this bundle, the um, BNB task list bundle. And that will go to the twig engine, render that template, give us a string back, and then we can pass that into our response object instead. So um, this is twig logo some reason all these sort of symphony things have li um, all of their own individual logos. But as you probably know, um, Twig was also going to be the templating language that's in use for Drupal 8. So again, there's an advantage there that if you go to Symphony as a framework for things that's not CM for your non sort of CMS work, then there's the parallel of the same templating language that you're learning for both. It's very basic, it looks something like this. We're gonna Two curly braces means that we're outputting that variable. So that name that went got passed into the array is getting output as name. And we're not going to go. I'm not going to talk too much about Twig. There's loads of things like filters, so we can say we want it uppercase functions to provide things like date, etc. <coughs> okay, so um, this is that controller action now looks. Um, because you're going to have to, if a lot of the actions render templates, this is going to get quite repetitive. So um, what you can actually do is there's a render method that combines those two steps. So it renders it for us, wraps it in that response object, and then you can return it. So we are still returning a response object. It's just hidden that away slightly. Um, but even that gets quite repetitive. So there's actually <laughs> an annotation that you can use that says, hey, I'm just going to return an array. 
So it's a little bit of a lie when I said it has to return a response object. If you don't return a response object, then um, the framework sort of fires off an event to have, and something, if you put in this annotation, something listens to that to say, oh, well, I'm going to try and render a template for you. So this was the array we were returning was the second argument of that um, render method, and it does that step for us. So we can really cut down what we actually get, but we are still eventually returning that response object. We can actually make it even shorter. I use a little bit of um, convention to kind of say, if it's as long as we're in the same bundle, we've got the, the view lives, so they, the templates live in the resources directory, in a view directory, as long as they're in a subdirectory called task, that's the same as our controller name, and it's called index.html.twigs, we're using the index action, then it will automatically use that template if it exists. So you can override it if you need to use a different template. If you don't, you can save writing all that out. So we can get our controller actions sort of down to the bare minimum, which is nice, because then we can see what it's actually doing without all the sort of boilerplate of rendering templates and things like that. But essentially, what we're always doing is this sort of overall concept of turning a request into a response. And the reason I've sort of mentioned that a few times is that those requests and response objects that live in the HTTP foundation component are the ones that the very same objects that are being used in various other sort of frameworks. So if you use Silex, which is a micro framework based on Symfony components, and there's Laravel 4 as well, which is, again, uses uh, quite a few Symfony components but builds a different sort of fra um, framework with a slightly different sort of approach on it. Easy published by and um, that, uh, Drupal 8 as well is going to be using those exact same um, <coughs> request and response objects. <coughs> okay, so we want to do something a little bit more interesting with our task thing. So um, we need a bit of doctrine as well within that. So when you doctrine um, is an ORM, or an object relational mapper, so basically deals with if you have an entity in your class and it deals with how do I save that to the database and retrieve it and things like that. Um, you don't have to use it for Symfony, it's there out of the box. And, um, but essentially one of the things Symfony sort of philosophy is to say, once you're in that controller action, whatever you do in there is up to you as long as you return that response object. Um, but it's there, so we'll use uh, Doctrine for this. So if you remember, when we were a composer, it gave us those parameters, and I chose database name, things like that. If we now run, again, console command, doctrine database create, it will create the database for us based on those values. And it'll just be a blank database at this point. Uh, okay. So we can, again, we can actually use the console to create an entity for us. So we want something that represents at task with um, some fields, so title, uh, description, the date it was created, and the date it was completed. So if we run this command, it will actually generate PHP class for us, and again, using annotations to map um, to the database. So for Doctrine, the entity classes that it uses don't themselves um, know about the database. They don't have save methods and things like that. It actually uses sort of metadata to tell it um, how to map the database. So we're using annotations, but again, you can use XML and YAML as well, and PHP itself. <coughs> uh, so there's various sort of annotations here saying it is an entity, it's got an ID, um, it's going to be automatically generated by the database, and a title, which goes to the title, um, column database description, created uh, and completed. Um, so once we've got that, so we've got that in the PHP in our bundle, so it'll automatically put in an entity directory in our bundle, and then we can run another command, Dr. Schema Create, and that will actually take that mapping information and create the database table for us. So if you, once you've run this, if you look in the database, you should see we've now got a task table uh, with title, description, ID, fields, etc. <coughs> and whilst we're at it, we might as well 
Again, use another console command um, to get going quickly. This option generates CRUD with um, telling it it's that entity. So what this will do is actually generate for us a controller, um, a form <coughs> class, which we'll have a look at, and, and templates for the basic sort of operations. So creating a task, updating a task, um, viewing a collection of them, and individual tasks. <coughs> so there's a couple of extra commands that um, options, read prefix of task, it just says we want to access these at the URL of task and then something. And with write just basically says, I, um, I don't just want to view them, I want to be able to have the create and update actions. So once we've done that, it doesn't look very nice, but we can jump to task slash new in the browser, see title description, and we don't really want them, but for now, because it gives us all the fields, you can control when it was created and when it's completed. So uh, for creating a task, we'll come back to in, in a minute, we can remove those last two because we just want to set the title and description have created or automatically done for us, and we'll, we can update it to say it's completed at another point. <coughs> um, one thing on this slide to note, down the bottom you can see it, there's um, this debug sort of toolbar, and it, which gives us various information about the um, request that happens. So on that we can say, and if you click on something it opens up and gives you all this. So this is just something to say in the dev, um, dev environment, but it gives you a huge amount of information to help you debug sort of requests and what's going on. So you can see all, in this tab all the stuff that came in, request, get, post, and things like that. There's information about how the routing worked, what happened with the form, whether there's any doctor and database queries, any email sent, and things like that. And again, I believe this has been sort of extracted from being quite so tied into something as it used to be, and made available as a separate library, so again, it can be used for Drupal 8. So the sort of thing it's going to create for us, so to get that page working for form, we've got a new, this new action, creates one of our task entities, and then it's got a little private method there for creating a form. And with, again, we're using the template annotation, so we're just returning an array with the entity itself and the form. And that private method that creates the form looks something like this. It's using another built-in method of the server, of the controller, the create form. And we're also using another one that's generate URL. So um, on those root annotations, if you name the routes, then you can uh, ask it to generate the URL for that. So it kind of decouples the uh, the actual URL um, so that you can just refer to it by name. So if you at some point reconfigure the URLs, it'll automatically get updated anywhere if it uses those. <coughs> and then this task type that it was creating there is this sort of form object, which is a pretty simple one at the moment, but um, these you kind of use to say, what fields do I want in my form? So we don't just automatically say, I've got a task entity, give it let you edit any of its things. Any, the only, when you submit that form back, uh, even if you sort of fiddle with the post request to try and set other fields, it'll only set the ones that are actually here in this um, form builder. Um, it does a sort of good job of guessing stuff as well based on the type of fields. So we'll get a normal text box, title, a text area for description and date fields that you Created and, date, created and completed. If you need to override that, you can pass a second argument that actually says this is the type of field that I want. <coughs> and the uh, template looks something like this. So it's slightly different in that we've now got blocks because it extends from a parent class that kind of wraps it. And this form function actually outputs the form. Um, and it is as easy as that to output the form. Fortunately, usually designers get in the way and want you to kind of break it down and output bits separately rather than just letting it look as ours did. Um, but sort of prototyping, prototyping <laughs> applications then, uh, the form function is really useful. <coughs> okay, so we wanted to remove the date time fields that create that thing. So if we jump into the form um, type back in there, just delete those last two lines, then they won't appear anymore. Um, if we just did that, it would cause us a couple of issues. So um, we need to go back into that entity, the task entity, and make a couple of changes. So one of those was to say that the completed column, I've added this nullable equals true attribute, because otherwise well, the database is going to complain when we try and save 
the completed field as blank, and added a constructor. So whenever you make a task entity, it automatically sets the created value to the current date time. And Doctrine never itself uses it, calls for a constructor, so we can safely do this. And then whenever we get it back from the database later, that value won't get updated. Um, there's console command, schema update this time, in order to actually get that nullable um, value reflect, uh, attribute reflected in the database itself. So whenever you're making sort of database changes, this command will keep it up to date for you. So now, it still doesn't look very nice, but we've lost those two additional fields there. Um, so you can just submit those and go to the show view, which shows us Title description that was created at the time it was submitted um, and completed. Unfortunately, it says it was completed at that point because um, we will show, um, because under the selecting in Twig Web, we pass it a null value and it, it defaults with the date filter to the current time. So we'll deal with that in a minute. But this is that show action. So again, this is generated code. This is getting the submitted value from the database. So built-in methods get hold of doctrine, and it uses an entity manager to retrieve entities. So we get that. We're passing an ID in this time from our URL, and we ask for the entity with that ID, throw an exception, automatic shows for a forward page if it doesn't exist. And if it does exist, then we pass it through to our template, which looks something like this. The same principle as folder double braces because we're but you've got these dots, so we're saying entity dot id entity dot title, and that automatically calls getter methods to display the title and the description um, and things like that for us. And you've got some basic logic in Twig as well, so we can modify this to say if there's a value for completed, display that line, otherwise leave it off, and that'll deal with that default value for us. So um, we'll now get rid of it and I thought it um, starts to look a bit more useful. <coughs> okay, we've also got a collection view that's created for us. There's only one there, but it gives us a table showing all the tasks that you add with a similar action. So, getting, it's, getting the doctrine manager, finding this time finding all rather than a particular ID and passing that um, collection of all of those entities, all of the tasks to the template. And the kind of interesting part of that template is here. So again, some logic in that we're looping through. So you've got those sort of basic for loops and say for everything in that array of entities, output this table or this table row. And you'll see one, another Twig function that Symphony adds in. It's not there if you use Twig standalone. It's a path function that's the same as that controller one for generating URLs from the um, from the root name. Okay, so going back to our show action, um, there's quite a lot of sort of lines of code going on here, and you can imagine that every for everything where you're you've got an ID, you want to get hold of that object, check if it exists or not for a 404, maybe if it doesn't, but you're going to end up with quite a lot of repetitive code. So as with the template annotation, we can actually lose quite a lot of this if we use an annotation called a param converter. So can I? get rid of pretty much all of the top of that and say, instead of saying I want the ID passing in, we're saying I want a task object passed in. So again, we're using the type hint to say I want one of those task entities and this param converter annotation. And what that will do, all of that work for us behind the scenes before we get to our controller action of saying, I see you've got an ID in the um, URL. I know you want a task entity. So I'm going to go and look in the database, find the task entity with that URL, with that ID. If it's there, I'll pass it into the controller action. If it's not, I'll throw that 404 for you. So we can lose a huge amount of code there again um, with the use of that annotation. Okay, cool. So, um, 
So it's um, you know, sort of generic, pretty basic thing. From there, you can add in. There's quite a lot of the other components that come with Symfony that let you kind of extend that in quite a useful way. So one of the things we can do would be to say, when I add a task, I want to notify somebody by email, for instance. And you can fire. Well, we could just do that in the controller action. But what you can do is use um, the event dispatcher instead to fire off an event. So it kind of then becomes like a hook where <coughs> you say this thing happens, so a new task is created, and you tell other things to listen for that particular event. And then in there we could do something like firing off an email, sending an SMS, etc. Um, so it's definitely something the event dispatch is worth looking at um, as a way of decoupling code. <coughs> And the other thing as well, which is kind of hidden from us when we sort of do basic uh, things like that, is behind the scenes with all those things like create form and get doctrine, is it hides um, something called the service container, which manages all these sort of services and objects for us. Um, so that you kind of just say this container, get doctrine, <coughs> and you don't really know what it is, and there's actually quite a complex sort of object graph that gets settled behind the scenes. So, again, the so as this sort of, once you get beyond these really simple kind of application thing where we're just saying make an entity, send it to the browser, uh, so send it to the template, then there's um, a lot of tools in there to help manage these um, more complex applications. And that's one of the things that, for me, that I found that when I first started using Symfony and Symfony 2, uh, that's really good about it. Um, is that it gives you that freedom once you're in those control directions. It gives you lots of tools to help you get in to get there and to create things like using these sort of console commands to get there easily. But it doesn't then tie you into that way, a particular way of doing things. It's like it gives you the freedom to do whatever you want once you're in that sort of action. So for me, that's a really good reason to use, to consider using Symfony as a framework. But it's another thing that's sh happened in the last sort of year or so, which quite cool, which is to do with this request to response sort of processing, which is <coughs> something called uh, stack PHP. Um, and the idea with stack, which came from, was inspired by Ruby's rack, is to wrap kind of common sort of features outside of your application. So at the simplest level, it might be something like saying, I'm going to move all my session handling outside of the application um, because it's something that affects the request and response. So what Stack does is it says that in a Symfony application, you've got that request and response, and it's got then something of the HTTP kernel foundation, uh, HTTP kernel component gives an interface which gets used by the um, the entry point into the application, and it's, and it's a really simple kind of method. It just says take the request and I return a response. But because of the session, you can kind of actually manipulate that request before it even gets to Symfony and inject it in. And then you can kind of stack up these things that you do around it. So we can say, I want to do some OAuth stuff, I want to do some GeoIP stuff, and I want the session before, um, before you even hit my Symfony application. But the cool thing with this is that because all of these things also use this HTTP kernel interface, is that you can wrap them all with these various things. So, what we can do is one of the stack things is a URL map where you can say, if it's this URL, go to this application. If it's this URL, go to this application. So, you could have a Symfony application and a Drupal installation, both sort of living alongside each other, um, and stack can deal with deciding which one of them goes to which, but you can also then wrap it in things like the auth and the session, so then it makes it really straightforward, which has always been one of the pain points with having, say, a CMS and a different framework live alongside each other. <coughs> um, it makes that kind of pain, some of the things like, I need to share a session, we need to share security and things like this, a lot easier to deal with, because Stack can deal with all of that. Something comes in, we create the session, we do authentication, then we decide, actually, uh, this, was a Drupal, this is something to do with Drupal, or this is something to do with Symfony. So like, and it's a relatively new project, but there's quite a lot of stuff being added, both at the core level and also contributed by people from Symfony, from Laravel, etc., to 
start to make all these things work well together and a lot more seamlessly than it would have been in the past where my experience, things like dealing with security and sessions involves all sorts of horrible kind of hacking to get them to work together. <coughs> okay, cool. So, sort of, most of what I've got to say, so I'm hopefully showing you some idea of what Symfony can do and how easy it is to get into doing some of the basic, like getting installed and generating things, and also for me why it's a good thing to learn if you're into Drupal. Um, do also have to do some marketing things that I was told to do. So, <laughs> as in, um, in Beaker um, and all the bits of it are uh, hiring. Um, for developers, BAs, project managers, etc., we have officers in these places. Um, so, well, London, so our biggest office. Um, Leeds is that big because it's new. <laughs> <laughs> and I use this slide at the Leeds Pit user group. <laughs> so, I'm from Sheffield, um, but yeah, we've got Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, Edinburgh, and and the, the big one in London, even though it's small. Um, so if you go to Mbika website, um, there's a lot more information about that there. Oh, and the other thing was that as Sensei Labs UK, we run sort of two and four day courses on Symphony, and apparently everyone who's attended this can have 20% off those courses in March. Um, again, if you go, well, if you go to the senseolabs.co.uk site for information on those, or you can call uh, Kieran McNulty on Twitter, who's uh, one of our trainers who is dealing with external training at the moment. Okay, um, but that's it. So thank you. Um, um, we got. I think it's time for maybe our question or two before we're done. If anyone's got any. Um, with the when you're doing the quick templates earlier, how does that <coughs> against <laughs> okay, um, it's a good question. It automatically. How do you deal? With, so, in terms of like escaping and things, yeah, um, it does it automatically. You have to specifically turn it off. Okay. So you can actually pipe something to raw if you know it's safe and it's got HTML in, but otherwise it will automatically um, uh, encode everything. Yeah, yeah, escape it. Yeah. Is there a symphony book that you can recommend, like the equivalent of PDD with this for Drupal? Um, there's not a a beginner's printed book as such. Um, not an intermediate level, not a beginner's book. Okay. Um, so for developers. For developers, yeah. Most of at the moment you probably best just there's the documentation on the website. Um, okay. there is a sort of uh, non beginner one that's um, like self published thing that someone's put called a, a year um, a year of symphony that covers sort of some of the more um, a guy called Matthew Snowback the uh, it, it doesn't teach you symphony, but gives you the kind of, if you've been using it for a while, here's sort of patterns for how to do configuration and dependency injection and things like that. So it's a good um, thing to look at once you've kind of exhausted the online documentation. Okay, right, thank you.